real quick. When I first went into Iraq in November 2003, so about two years ago at this point, um, it was a totally, totally different situation. Um, you could go in over the land in a car from Amman and it wasn't that big of a risk. Now it's basically impossible for a Westerner to do that. Um, and basically going in the first time, um, and it's still kind of the extent today that, I mean, I have press credentials now, but the first time I went in, I did not. I made my own press pass. Because in Baghdad, I mean, think about it, it was seven months after Saddam was removed, there's no state. So imagine all of a sudden, our government's just gone overnight. So basically, any piece of plastic with your photo on it hanging, hanging on a lanyard around your neck, you're official. You just <laughs> hold it out, all right, go on through. I, I tend to not talk about like my story of why I went to Iraq and that I wasn't, uh, I don't have formal journalism training and all this sort of thing and that I just went, but, but I, I want to use it as an example because it's something that basically you know, it's, uh, it's kind of an everyman story that, that people, you can do what you feel is important to be done and it will make a difference. Um, I basically went because I was off. And I was off at the ridiculous corporate media coverage of the build up to the invasion, which now we see is all based on a pack of lies. And then that coverage on through the invasion and occupation, not showing how it affects civilians, not showing how it's affecting U.S. soldiers. I went over there with an email list of 130 people that wanted to get basically web logs that I would write. And so I, I went in about 15 months from a guy sending out 130 emails, uh, emails to 130 friends back home to let them know what I was seeing in Baghdad to a website that at times was getting a million hits a day. I've been on four different trips, and every trip it's been almost like a different country because it's deteriorated so quickly. But the last time in Iraq, which was um, January and early February of this year, I stayed in a hotel. It, there's basically two guarded hotel compounds now that journalists have a choice to stay at because if you stay at a hotel not in those guarded compounds, most of them just won't take you. They're like, oh, sorry, white guy, go away. We don't want a car bomb. They won't take Westerners because literally people have been drug out of hotels to be kidnapped or they car bomb hotels. So there's two compounds and we just saw what happened to one of them where the Palestine and, and Sheridan Hotel are. So it's kind of a false sense of security, but that's one of them. The other one is over in Jadria district of Baghdad where you have to actually go through a checkpoint to get to the hotel. So I stayed in one of those and I, had, I grew a beard. I dress as locally as I can to try to fit in. And then I would have my interpreter come at different times every day to always vary it and don't have a pattern and then take different routes leaving the hotel, drive around a while to make sure you're not being followed and then go to your interview, don't talk English in public. So you do the best you can and just know that this is, you know, this is just a bad place to work. Streets, you know, just to give you an idea of the culture in Iraq, it's, you know, classic Arab culture. It's very warm, very welcoming and generous. When we're out working on stories, Whenever it's lunchtime, wherever you are, they're going to feed you, and you're not going to, you're not allowed to say no. That you know, you're, you, we would be in there interviewing like one of these guys that I interviewed who was tortured, horrific stories, and then you finish, and it, you know, maybe he'll stop crying, and you know, you kind of stop, and and uh, and then they'll say, okay, well, let's have tea, and then okay, well, it's like uh, almost lunchtime, even though lunch passed like two hours ago. It's like okay, you must stay, you have to eat. So typically. Nine times out of ten, you're eating lunch with whoever you interview, and then and then uh, at, at dinner, just grab a kebab on the way home. According to a Human Rights Watch report released on April 27th of this year, quote, Abu Ghraib was only the tip of the iceberg. It's now clear that abuse of detainees has happened all over, from Afghanistan to Guantanamo Bay to a lot of third country dungeons where the U.S. has sent prisoners and probably quite a few other places we don't even know about. The earlier report of Major General Antonio Tacuba found numerous incidents of sadistic, blatant, and wanton criminal abuses constituting systematic and illegal abuse of detainees at Abu Ghraib. Other human rights groups report that U U.S. military doctors, nurses, and medics have been complicit in torture and other illegal procedures such as those administered to Sadiq Zoman. 55-year-old Zoman, detained from his home in Kirkuk in a raid by U.S. soldiers that produced no weapons, 
was taken to a police office in Kirkuk, the Kirkuk Airport Detention Center, the Tikrit Airport Detention Center, and then finally the U.S. 28th Combat Support Hospital where he was treated by Dr. Michael Hodges, a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges' medical report listed the primary diagnosis, diagnosis of Zoman's condition as hypo hypoxic brain injury, which is brain damage caused by lack of oxygen, with persistent vegetative state, myocardial infarction, heart attack, and heat stroke. After one month in custody, Zoman was dropped off in a coma at the General Hospital in Tikrit by U.S. soldiers. Zoman's last name was listed as his first name on the report, despite the fact that all of Zoman's identification papers were taken during the raid on his home. Because of this, it took his family weeks to locate him in the hospital. Hodge's medical report did not mention the fact that the back of Zoman's head was bashed in, nor that he had electrical burn marks on the bottoms of his feet and genitals, or why he had lash marks across his back and chest. Today, he lies in bed still in a coma, and there has been no compensation provided to his now impoverished family for what was done to Sadiq Zoman. Hospitals in Iraq continue to face ongoing medicine, equipment, and staffing shortages under the U.S.-led occupation. During the 1990s, medical supplies and equipment were constantly in short supply because of the sanctions against Iraq. While the war and occupation brought promises of relief from the effects of the sanctions, throughout Baghdad, there are ongoing shortages of functional equipment and medicines of even the most basic items, such as analgesics, antibiotics, anesthetics, and insulin. In April of 2004, an International Committee for the Red Cross report stated that hospitals in Iraq were overwhelmed with new patients, short of medicine and supplies, and lacked both adequate electricity and water, the chief manager at Shuadar General Hospital, one of the two hospitals in the sprawling slum area of Sadr City, Baghdad, and home to three million people, added that they too suffered from a shortage of most supplies. But for his hospital, the lack of potable water was the major problem. Shuadar Hospital needs at least 2,000 liters of water per day to function with basic sterilization practices. According to Dr. al Nuaisri, they receive 15% of this amount. The rest of the water is contaminated and causing problems, as are the electricity cuts, added al Nuaisri. Without electricity, our instruments in the operating room cannot work, and we have no pumps to bring us water. At Fallujah General Hospital, Dr. Ahmed, who asked that only his first name be used because he feared U.S. military reprisals, said of the April 2004 siege, quote, the Americans shot out the lights in the front of our hospital. They prevented doctors from reaching the emergency unit at the hospital, and we quickly began to run out of supplies and much needed medications. He also said that several times, Marines kept the physicians in the residence building, intentionally prohibiting them from entering the hospital in order to treat patients. In November, shortly after raising Nizal Emergency Hospital to the ground, U.S. forces entered Fallujah General Hospital the city's only health care facility for trauma victims, detaining employees and patients alike. According to medics on the scene, water and electricity were cut off, ambulances targeted or confiscated by the U.S. military, and surgeons, without exception, kept out of the besieged city. Hospital raids by the U.S. military and U.S.-backed Iraqi forces now appear to be standard operating procedure. On the 18th of June of this year, Doctors at the main hospital in Bakuba went on strike, saying they were fed up with the constant abuse at the hands of aggressive Iraqi police and soldiers. Dr. Mohammed Hazem in Bakuba pleaded for his governor to, to protect he and his colleagues from, quote, organized terrorism of the police and army. When wounded Iraqi security forces showed up demanding treatment, a Dr. Hussein told one of them he would require an x-ray. The doctor was told to go to hell by the policeman he was treating and was then beaten. The same policeman then ordered other police officers to put a bag over the doctor's head and take him away. Our security guards tried to stop them, telling them I was a doctor, but they didn't listen and beat the security guards too, he said. Then one of them put a gun to my head and threatened me. Similar behavior has been reported during the recent U.S.-Iraqi military operations in Haditha and Al-Qaim. 
Doctors also recently went on strike at the large Yarmouk hospital in Baghdad in a very similar incident. Many doctors in Iraq believe that the lack of assistance, if not outright hostility, by the U.S. military, coupled with the lack of rebuilding and reconstruction by foreign contractors, has compounded the problems they are facing. The former ambassador of Iraq, Paul Brimmer, admitted that the U.S.-led coalition spending on the Iraqi health system was inadequate. Quote, it's not nearly enough to cover the needs in the health care field. When asked if his hospital had received assistance from the U.S. military or reconstruction contractors, Dr. Sarmad Rahim, the administrator of chief doctors at Al Kirk Hospital in Baghdad, said, never ever. At Fallujah General Hospital, Dr. Muhammad said there has been virtually no assistance from foreign contractors. And of the U.S. military, he commented, they send only bombs, not medicine. International aid has been stymied by the horrendous security situation in Iraq. After the UN headquarters was bombed in Baghdad in August of 2003, killing 22 people, aid agencies and NGOs either reduced their staffing or pulled out entirely. With senior Iraqi doctors fleeing Iraq en masse for fear of being kidnapped, interns and younger doctors are left to deal with the catastrophic situation. The World Health Organization last year warned of a health emergency in Baghdad as well as throughout Iraq if current conditions persist and persist they have. But while Iraq sits upon a sea of oil, ongoing gasoline shortages plague Iraqis who sometimes wait two days just to fill their cars. In a country where a long gas line once meant a one-car wait, Iraqis who were lucky enough to afford it now purchase black market petrol and hope that it is not watered down. Electricity remains in short supply. Most of Iraq including the northern region, receives on average three hours of electricity per day amidst a nearly non-existent reconstruction effort. Even the better areas of Baghdad receive only six to eight hours per day, forcing those who can afford them to use small generators to run fans and refrigerators in their homes. Of course, this is only for those who've been able to obtain the now rarefied gasoline. The security situation is, needless to say, horrendous. With over 100,000 Iraqis killed thus far, and the number of U.S. soldiers killed now well over 2,000, the violence only continues to escalate. Since the new Iraqi so-called government was sworn in this past April, well over 4,000 Iraqis and over 550 U.S. soldiers have died in the violence. These numbers will only continue to escalate as the occupation grinds on. As the heavy-handed tactics of the U.S. military persist, the Iraqi resistance continues to grow in both its number and lethality. As I mentioned before, potable water remains in short supply. Cholera, typhoid, and other waterborne diseases are rampant even in parts of the capital city as lack of reconstruction continues to plague Iraq's infrastructure. Raw sewage is common not just throughout Baghdad but other cities around Iraq. With over 70% unemployment, a growing resistance, and an infrastructure in shambles, the future for Iraq remains bleak as long as the occupation persists. While the Bush administration continues to disregard calls for a timetable for withdrawal, Iraqis continue to suffer and die with little hope for their future. With each passing day, the catastrophe in Iraq resembles the U.S. debacle in Vietnam more and more. Dr. Wamid Omar Nathmi, a senior political scientist at Baghdad University, told me last winter during an interview, it will take Iraqis something like a quarter of a century to rebuild their country, to heal their wounds, to reform their society, to bring about some sort of national reconciliation, democracy, and tolerance for each other. But that process will not begin until the U.S. occupation of Iraq ends. A poll that was commissioned by the British military in Iraq and conducted through an Iraqi university, uh, the results were leaked to the press on October 24th, and that poll found that 82% of Iraqis strongly oppose the continuing presence of foreign troops in their country. It also found that less than 1% of the population felt that foreign troops have helped improve security. And it also found that 45% of Iraqis felt that attacks against U.S. troops were justified. 
As far as the situation with U.S. soldiers, even according to a U.S. Army survey, the results were released this past summer. They surveyed all of the units in Iraq and found that 56% of all the units in Iraq reported either low or very low morale. Another Army survey, this was in even the Wall Street Journal on the 29th of July of this past summer. The Army Surgeon General said that a survey of troops returning from Iraq found that 30% had developed mental health problems within three to four months. Ironically, as I kind of alluded to earlier, the U.S. military has probably engaged in more successful reconstruction projects in Iraq than have the Western corporations who've been awarded tens of billions of dollars of our tax money. Um, the U.S. military does it, um, not, it's not their job to reconstruct the country, uh, it's, but they do it to win over trust of, of different communities. And so they have uh, succeeded in reconstructing, re reconstructing, for example, uh, I think it's about 100, 120 schools. But the big job goes to companies like Bechtel because with over 6,000 schools in Iraq, that's why they're being paid billions and billions of dollars. But most reconstruction projects have either come to a dead standstill or not, uh, not even been started. Uh, one reason is, of course, the violence has made it uh, almost impossible for them to continue. But the other main reason is because they won't hire Iraqis to do the work for them, who, of course, know how to rebuild their country better than anyone. Um, and instead, to increase their profit margin, they're hiring what they call third country nationals, people from Sri Lanka, India, places like this. Bechtel, for example, has been paid out in full for their initial contract. Uh, it's, an, it, it's a contract like most of these, which was a, a no-bid, cost-plus, fixed-fee contract. It was awarded to them before the war was even over. Um, cost plus fixed fee means they are guaranteed a profit no matter what happens. It's, it's quite a deal. And they've been paid out in full for this contract, $680 million, and since been awarded contracts totaling $3.8 billion. And technically, they're not in violation of their contract because as long as they've got a guy on the ground in Iraq saying, yeah, we still intend to get to that, then technically, the way the contract's written up, they're not in violation. Meanwhile, the people paying the price are, the highest price are the Iraqi civilians, uh, as I talked about, rampant cholera, kidney stones, diarrhea, child malnutrition now in Iraq is worse than it was even during the sanctions, where half a million children died. Um, the, the people paying the next highest price would be the U.S. soldiers, because it's my opinion that if, if these companies had fulfilled one-third the promises that were made as far as giving Iraqis jobs, giving them an opportunity for a better life, we wouldn't be looking at near the resistance, the violent resistance that we have now in Iraq. And of course, uh, the people paying the highest price for that are Iraqi civilians and, and U.S. soldiers. And then, of course, uh, um, a little further down the list is us who are funding this whole operation. There were hundreds of ammo dumps uh, right after the fall of Baghdad that were left totally unguarded. Um, really what happened was, uh, again, it was a situation where we had people in this administration that continually overrode the military planners' ideas of how to do this invasion. And you had these people like Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld who never served in the military making military decisions. They didn't go in with the number of troops that the military planners said they were going to basically need three times as many troops if they wanted to actually do it the right way and then start to provide some security. That's why to this day the borders are pretty much wide open. Um, right now as we speak you can get a semi truck full of whatever you want through the border from Jordan to Iraq by bribing a guard five bucks. Iraq already, aside from Lebanon, in the Middle East was the best place for women's rights, period. They sent women on, to get university degrees outside as to become doctors, to become scientists. They didn't force them to wear hijabs. You go around Baghdad, even in the beginning three, four months of the occupation, you could walk around Baghdad and see women dressed as if they were in Europe. If you want to talk about women's rights in Iraq today, I suggest you go there and see for yourself and talk to Iraqi women about how they feel about it. I talked to a friend there about a week ago in Baghdad. She doesn't leave her house. Most women don't leave their house unless they absolutely have to because crime is so bad.
because they're going to be either kidnapped or raped. About the only place in Iraq where women have halfway decent rights is in the northern regions of Kurdistan. Women's rights, democracy. The most common quote I've heard from Iraqis in all my time in Iraq is, this is the freedom, this is the democracy. And it's because people really could care less about the political process at this point. They don't really care who's even in charge so much as they care. They just want the violence to stop. They just, they want 70% unemployment to get down to something like it was during the sanctions, which was like 30%. They want more than three hours of electricity in their house. They want the ability to get a job. They want the ability to get food. If we talk about democracy and freedom and women's rights and a better life in Iraq, it's not happening now. And if we check the polls that Iraqis conduct themselves, this was conduct, this poll numbers I read you earlier, about 82% of Iraqis wanting occupation forces out of their country yesterday, that's conducted by an Iraqi university. So if this was truly about democracy and freedom and giving the Iraqi sovereignty, then I think it's time that the U.S. gives them sovereignty and abides by their wishes and basically gets the hell out of their country. Okay, let's, let's put things in perspective. Let's start with the January 30 elections, 40% turnout according to even the Israeli Secret Service in Iraq and Iraqis on the ground. So January 30 elections, the people that did risk their lives to vote, and that was a very historic thing, and people in Iraq who voted were very, very moved by it and very grateful for the opportunity. The people that voted did so because the Iraqi politicians running for office, the very few that actually ran giving their names, that most people ran anonymously in this January 30 so-called election. And the people that voted for them did so because they were promised by these people, and this wasn't reported in the media here, they were promised that this was going to bring about an end to the occupation. And the people told them, vote for me and I will demand a timetable for withdrawal. So we have a very, very dangerous situation in Iraq now also because these people then took power in this temporary government and they are not fulfilling that promise that they made to demand a timetable for withdrawal. If you remember, after January 30, there was a situation where it took about two weeks for them to release the results. During that two weeks, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld flew to Iraq met with many of the new upcoming political leaders and basically had them not demand a timetable for withdrawal. It's been rated the most dangerous place in the world for journalists to work for a couple of years running now, essentially since almost the beginning of the occupation. Um, over 100 journalists have now been killed in Iraq. That's more than in 20 years were killed in Vietnam. It all started during the invasion itself. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. I think the three main culprits are, A, just the security situation overall. It's dangerous for everyone there, no matter what you're doing with car bombs and gun battles. And uh, that's, that's one reason. Another is the, the, the level of crime is just really unbelievable there. There's literally no law. There's no state really in place. There's, there's no respect. So you can literally just walk up to someone on the streets of Baghdad, shoot them in the head, and walk away, and you're probably going to be fine. Um, and then another reason is the U.S. military. Um, it, in my opinion, has been a deliberate uh, strategy of the U.S. military from the beginning of the invasion on to target reporters who might not be reporting the company line. This started, uh, most of you probably saw bits and pieces of this, where during the invasion, Al Jazeera, for example, during what happened in Afghanistan, their office in Kabul was bombed twice by the U.S. military. So they figured in Iraq, they'd play it safe, and they got their exact office coordinates, gave them to the Pentagon, and said, here they are, here we are, please don't bomb us. They, of course, were bombed. One of their cameramen, was, one of their journalists was killed on the same day that Abu Dhabi television was attacked by tanks, that office was. And then also on the same day, a US, tanks, a US tank fired at the Palestine Hotel and killed a Spanish cameraman there. Um, of course, there's been consistent flack coming from journalist unions and Reuters from time to time and various networks towards the U.S. military for their practices. Um, and even here in the U.S., Jordan Eason, a former ex uh, executive at CNN at a conference, came out and said, yeah, it does appear that the U.S. military is deliberately targeting independent journalists. And then, of course, within a week, he was forced to resign. 
for those remarks. Um, and it's, so it, it is ongoing, and um, I've talked with Giuliana Sagrina personally, the Italian journalist who was uh, almost killed when, after she was kidnapped and she was on her way to the Baghdad airport from the green zone on a secured road. And everyone there knew they were leaving her with her Italian bodyguard and, and two other people in the car. And they were going down a road with the light on inside the car. It's totally secured road. They passed a military vehicle. And then the military vehicle shot their vehicle between three and 400 times from behind and killed her bodyguard. And she was shot in the shoulder. And she feels very strongly that it is a deliberate assassination attempt. But she, she, because she was covering things like what happened in Fallujah during, during the, the latest siege. But yeah, it's it's very, very dangerous place to work as, uh, as a journalist, uh, embedded or otherwise, but especially if you're not embedded. They have absolutely no intentions of withdrawing. You know, there's all this talk on, on the left and in the anti-war movement, well, do we pull out right now, or what about finishing the job and all this? And I'm really sick of hearing that talk because what we need to be talking about is the fact that there's 14 permanent U.S. military bases under construction in Iraq. There's 106 temporary bases. They're already using Iraq to project military power into other places in the Middle East. There's already been fighting, quite a bit of fighting, on the Syrian border with, with Syrian soldiers. And even this past May, and I wasn't the first person to report it, but I reported that there were U.S. jets regularly flying into Syrian airspace. So that's what Iraq is for. It's about controlling dwindling resources. It's about having a beachhead in the Middle East. They are, as we speak, getting ready to go into Syria. And they are going to go into Iran before these people leave office. I, I would, you know, I might be wrong, I hope that I'm wrong, but I'd be really, really surprised if they don't. And uh, people like uh, Scott Ritter are, have, have a lot of inside knowledge about this sort of thing going on. And he reported even a ways back that Bush had already signed off on plans for, to, to put forth a massive aerial bombardment of Iran. And the only way that these people are going to leave office at this point between them already being in power and elect the black box voting that will happen in 2006 and will happen again in 2008 unless we make it otherwise. The only way they're going to be removed from power is if we remove them. We are in crisis right now in this country. We need to be talking about 100,000 dead Iraqis and over 2,030 dead U.S. soldiers, not whether someone's lying to a court. These people have to be removed immediately. People always ask me, uh, well, what else can we do? And, and we've already had some really good ideas. But take a minute now and think about what is the one thing that you've thought about doing but, but haven't done um, to try to affect some positive change, whether it's here domestically or regarding the situation in Iraq. What is that one thing? Everyone has it of, that either you've been too afraid to do or unwilling to do, or it's been too big of an inconvenience. Uh, for whatever reason you haven't done it, maybe it is getting involved in independent media, maybe it's go to your first demonstration, maybe it's go shut down a, a, a friendly congressperson's office. Uh, whatever that thing is, it's going to be different probably from, for everyone. It's a really individual thing. And so right now, just to try to get the ball rolling, because I think this is a critical enough time in this country, Think about what that one thing is that is the next step for you to do and turn to that person that you've been talking to tonight and commit to them to do that one thing.